Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. Well, y'all, welcome to church. Today we're going to continue our replay of that series that we did last year called Different. This is actually our last message in the series. It's going to transition me into the next series, which I'm excited about too. But in case you don't know me, my name's Cade. I'm the lead pastor here alongside my wife, Beth. Here at No Limits, we're here to help you know God, find freedom, and discover purpose. And in the end, our end goal is to equip you to go out and make a difference for the kingdom of God. I think you get that idea based on Chris Wills being up here every Sunday, right, to let you all know what we're up to. Um, But before we get into the message today, I want to remind you of what we're after this year. I know you guys can tell me by now. What are we after? Team. It's, this year is all about team. It's what we can do together for the kingdom of God. So whenever you find yourself doing something by yourself, the, it should go off like an alarm should go off inside you. I'm doing something wrong. I need to go find out how to engage a team so that we can work together at this. Speaking of, if you're not in a culture impact team, what are you doing? Why are you not in a team? There's like, uh, the schedule is like wide open. They're on different days, different times. I, I bet you can find one that works for you. And if you say the business is the only one that works for you, and you're like, man, I just don't want to get with Anthony that often, you know? <laughs> That's all right. You might find out that you like him anyway. And this is just, you know, this is one small group semester, 13 weeks. You can handle him for 13 weeks, right? Actually, one, one of them's already gone. So you only got to handle him for 12 weeks now. It's getting better and better. But seriously, I'll join a culture impact team. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bless you, and that's how we get together and make a difference for the kingdom of God. You're like, if you're thinking, you know, well, I got, Kate, I got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, me too, right? But if we let the things of this life cloud over what we're going to do to impact the kingdom of God, what are we really doing? So get your priorities in the right place, and God's going to bless you for that. Can I get an amen? amen. Or no me or no my, or whatever you want to say to that. All right, here we go. Let's get into the message today. I want to show you guys today that abundance, living in God's abundance, is not just financial, it also includes your health. So let's start with the scripture where we find out that Jesus came to give us abundant life. In John 10.10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Did you know that when Jesus gives you eternal life, it includes this life? Did you know that? It's not just a ticket to heaven. It's an immediate transition into abundant life right now. And if you're not walking in it, it's because you've allowed the enemy to still kill and destroy it from you. That's why. And how you do that is by getting caught up in this life. That's how he does it. So turn off the noise, the world's noise, and get with Jesus. He's got abundant life for you. Is there anyone who wants to do more than just survive? Anybody? Any takers for abundant life? Are you sure? Any takers for abundant life? Jesus wants you to have it. In other words, you guys, to follow Jesus, I must walk in abundant life. It's not, it's not a choice. Like, we just got to do it. It's such a bummer when Christians believe the lie that we're supposed to live a barely enough life. You know, we think, we get off in this idea and we think, how could I ask God for anything when he's already given me the gift of heaven? 
It sounds so religious, so sacrificial. You pat yourself on the back for saying that one, right? But in reality, it's selfish. It's selfish, and on top of this, you're belittling the power of God because he wants to do these incredible things in your life. And you just stick out your hand and you say, no, God, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But Jesus came to give you abundant life. He came to give you abundant life. He already gave it to you, actually. It's already been done. And it starts the moment you say yes to Jesus, and it follows you all the way into eternity. So quit letting the enemy steal this from you and receive what Jesus died to give you abundant life. You know, God's given me the ability to look at you and see your potential. I see it. You feel like you're stuck, but when I look at you, I can already see who you're meant to become. You feel like it's far away, but I can see that it's just on the surface. You just got to say yes to it. You're called by God. You, you are called by God. He has a special assignment for your life. And to walk in it, you just have to decide, I'm not living a pitiful life. I'm living the abundant life that Jesus gave me. And I know your potential. God knows your potential. And it's up to you to boldly become who God has called you to be. I can't do it for you. If I could, I would. But the world's going to be a better place if you choose to walk in abundant life. It'll be a better place. So what I'm going to show you today is that abundant life isn't just financial. It also includes divine health. And we're going to go to the account of Lazarus as an example. So Jesus gets the news that his friend Lazarus is really sick. And his sisters thought it was extreme, extremely urgent, as if Lazarus could die at any moment. But here's how Jesus responds whenever the sisters tell him about this. He says, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Somebody needs to write that on the bathroom mirror, the highlighted part. This sickness is not unto death, period. Somebody go write that on your mirror. If you need that, go write it down. This sickness is not unto death. But you know, people get messed up on the rest of this scripture. This is where the whole idea comes from, that God's going to allow people to get sick so that he can receive glory for their healing. Blah. Again, this is one of those things that sounds good. Man, that sounds good, but it doesn't agree with the rest of Scripture. But if this is the only Scripture you read, you're going to believe it. You're going to believe a lie. Like if you're lazy with your Bible, instead of loving your Bible, you're going to believe all kinds of things that aren't even true. I'm going to give you a flurry of Scriptures that will prove how silly it is to believe that God would allow sickness for His glory. It's just silly, silly, silly. Psalms 103.3, he forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. Psalms 107.20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Isaiah 53.5, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. And then Matthew 8.16, Jesus cast out evil spirits with a simple command and he healed all the sick. Clearly, God is in the healing business. Come on. He doesn't want you to be sick. He wants you to be well. Let me continue to prove it to you by showing you what Jesus said. In John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus only did the will of God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So if we want to know God, all we have to do is look at Jesus. Because when we see Jesus, we see the Father. Did Jesus ever refuse to heal? No. Did he ever bless somebody with sickness? No. Did he ever give somebody sickness to teach them something? No. This is how we know that it is always, always, always God's will to heal. Always. Jesus displayed the will of the Father for us. So if we want to know how God feels about sickness, just read the Gospels and see how Jesus handles sickness. And I'll give you a hint. He was on mission to destroy it. So where does sickness come from? We just read it earlier. Satan's the one doing the killing, right? But here's another scripture to prove it. Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by who? The devil. For God was with him. Oppression. Sickness is oppression from the devil. That's what it is. It's not a lesson from God. God does not put sickness on you to teach you. We just read the story a few weeks ago about how the disciples asked Jesus, what was the cause of this man who was born blind? You guys remember that story? And they asked if it was his fault or his parents' fault. Like, whose fault is this? And here's what Jesus said. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. But wait, like, is this saying that God made him blind so that Jesus could heal him later? Y'all, this doesn't even make sense when you know the character of God. 
If we as imperfect people know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does our Heavenly Father know how to give us good gifts? How many parents in the room would get, give your child sickness to teach them something? Anybody? No, we wouldn't do that. That'd be considered child abuse. Good grief. Yeah, we're going to believe that God brings sickness into our life to, for His glory or for something like that? That's foolishness. We're not going to believe that. Not here. If you want to believe that, you're going to have to go somewhere else because I ain't going to let you. God's a good father. He sent his word to heal us. He sent Jesus to heal us, and he only gives us good gifts. And for the record, sickness is not a good gift. So with God's character in mind, we have to read this scripture again. And honestly, I think the translators just messed up the punctuation on this one. Because Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the wor- work the works of him who sent me. So that's how you find it in the New King James Version, but I want you to look at what happens when you use different punctuation. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, period. But that the works of God should be revealed in him, I must work the ones of him who sent me. I know this is probably going to make some people upset because I'm, you know, proposing different punctuation. Sorry about that. But in order to understand scripture, we got to study the full counsel of God's word. And this is what agrees with the rest of God's word. God didn't make this man sick. Neither did his parents. Sickness is oppression from the devil. That's where it comes from. And Jesus is going to glorify God by knocking the sickness out. That's what the scripture is saying. So let's go back to Jesus's response about Lazarus being sick. So the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. So with the full counsel of God's word, we can now understand what Jesus is saying here. If he was an Oki here in 2022, he would have said, hey, y'all, I know Lazarus is sick but he ain't going to die. Well, at least not permanently. Actually, God's going to receive the glory for what's about to happen. He's going to kick that sickness in the tail. I've scoured the scriptures regarding this subject. Y'all, I've looked up and handwritten every single scripture that mentions healing, that mentions sickness, that mentions wholeness, because I wanted to get it. And I can tell you with absolute confidence that God does not give you sickness. He's not going to do it. He doesn't leave it with you to teach you something. He doesn't allow it in your life to teach you something. That's just a lie that the enemy uses to keep you sick. And as soon as you get that lie out of your head, you're going to experience healing. Ah, Sickness is oppression from the devil. It comes from the devil. It does not come from God. But God provided healing through Jesus Christ. He does not want his children sick. He wants them well. I think I've said that about 30 times already today. But you know how I know that healing is ours? Because the enemy's trying to steal it from us. He can't steal something that we already, or that we don't possess already. You have to have it already for him to steal it from you. You've got to get the religious nonsense that God wants you sick out of your head. Because when you get rid of the lies, you're able to believe and receive that healing that's already been provided for you. In other words, to follow Jesus, I must believe God wants me well. Plus, if you're going to believe that God wants you sick, Why are you going to the doctor? Why are you taking medications? Are you trying to get out of the will of God? Mm. It's funny how these unbiblical religious beliefs always lead us to hypocrisy. Every single time. Every single time. God does not want you sick. God does not use sickness to teach you something. God wants you well. And for clarity, I'm not knocking doctors here. Sometimes God uses doctors to help you get well. All right. So what happened to old Lazarus? Well, since Jesus was never in a hurry, he waited a few days before going to see Lazarus. And by the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. This is not good for Jesus's reputation. I mean, he basically lied to us, right? Because he said this sickness would not end in death. But wait a minute. He never said Lazarus wouldn't die. He said it wouldn't end in death. Hmm. But what did Jesus' disciples say about all this? Well, you got to cue the disciples for some comedic relief during this heavy moment, right? Bring them in. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. (laughs) From their perspective, all hope was lost. I mean, Jesus had really messed up this time, so they might as well just call it quits. It's over. We're done. Let's just go die right now. Forget about all the people Jesus already healed. He didn't heal his best friend, so it's over. We're done. 
So once again, Jesus finds himself surrounded by people who are without faith. But thankfully, there is one person who still believes, at least for now. Now, Martha, Martha still believes, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Wow, we should take some tips from Martha. She had it going on. She was fully aware of what they were up against. She wasn't denying the fact that he was dead. But even though it looked impossible, she knew that whatever Jesus asked God, God was going to do. And here's how Jesus responded to Martha. He said to her, your brother will rise again. This is great news. But, you know, like many other things that the Bible promises us, Martha delays the promise to heaven. Take a look at what she says. She says, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection, in the last day. Oh, I know I'll be healed in heaven. Oh, I know I'll have abundance in heaven. Oh, I know I'll be free from the bondage of sin in heaven. We're just going to delay it, throw it out there till later, right? Anyone else have a tendency to delay the promises of God until heaven? Like Martha did? Well, here's how Jesus responds. I am the resurrection and the life. How many times I got to tell you? He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Okay, let's break this down. Jesus is talking about two groups of people here. The first group, they believe in Jesus, but that's it. Stops there. They believe. And even though they live this life like they're dying, we'll see them in heaven. We'll see them in heaven because they believe in Jesus. Then you have the second group. They don't just believe. They live and believe in Jesus. And because of this, they experience abundant life here on earth and in heaven. Cool. Cool. And Jesus asks, do you believe this? Do you believe? Because you have a choice. You can believe in Jesus and leave it at that. And although your earthly life is going to suck, we'll see you in heaven. We'll have a good time there. All right? Or you can believe and live in Jesus and start your abundant life right now. Right now. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God loves you either way. He does. But can I tell you, embracing abundant life isn't just going to benefit you It's going to benefit all those around you. In other words, to follow Jesus, I must not delay the promises of God. So after this conversation with Martha, Jesus goes to talk with Mary and some of the others, and they're all crying and upset because Jesus was too late. He was just too late. And the Bible says that Jesus wept as well. We don't know exactly why Jesus cried, because Jesus already knew that he was going to be resurrected. So I'm not, I don't think it was about Lazarus. I think he was just deeply troubled by everybody's unbelief. Can you imagine how frustrated he would have been at this point? Any parents in the room ever cried and grieved because your kids didn't do what you asked them to do? Like, they were out there trying to make this terrible decision. You tried to help them, and they just didn't even listen to you. So even though Jesus was grieved, it didn't stop him from moving ahead with this miracle. Because Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Remember how Martha was the most promising one of the bunch? What happened? What happened to her? She's the one that said, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. And then here she is, now trying to talk Jesus out of working a miracle. We're still pretty good at this today. Trying to talk God out of working miracles in our life. Oh God, if you want me to bring sick to, if you want me to be sick to bring glory to you, so be it. I'll be healed one day in heaven. God's like, I'm just trying to heal you. (laughs) Goodness. These kind of prayers do not impress God. They're quite aggravating to him if I had to guess. He just wants to heal you, and you keep talking yourself out of it. (laughs) Thankfully, they moved the stone like Jesus asked him to, and here's what he said next. He lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of these people who are standing by, I said this, that they might believe that you sent me. (laughs) Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. See, Jesus told you it wouldn't end in death. He told you. 
We all would have rather if Jesus healed Lazarus before he died, but hey, raising him from the dead, that's not so bad. There's so many times that we give up on healing just because it doesn't happen in our timeline. We get prayed for at church, and if it doesn't happen instantly, we lose all hope. We understand that sickness comes on as a progression, like it usually starts out small and it grows into something terrible if we don't take care of it. Yet when it comes to healing, we want it right now, instantaneous. And if it doesn't come instantaneous, then I must not be healed. Yes, healing can be instantaneous. We've seen it many times. But can I propose to you that healing also can come on as a progression? It starts small and then it grows until you're completely well. It may be hours or days or weeks after you've been prayed for, but step by step you walk into complete healing because you don't let it go. How often do you think people miss out on God's healing because they give up on it if they don't see it within 10 seconds? They give up and welcome that sickness right back into their life. Can we move past the idea that all healing has to be instantaneous and realize that there's no bad way to get healed? There's not a bad way. I always tell Beth, Beth, if I die prematurely, you better raise me from the dead because I ain't done yet. We got a pact going. I'll do the same for her. We need to believe that God wants us well and remain in faith no matter how long it takes. So you got to settle it in your heart right now. God wants me well. God wants me well. And don't deviate from it no matter what you experience. Don't wait for the doctor to tell you you're well. Jesus already told you. You've been made well. You should simply believe, God, I know you healed me 2,000 years ago when Jesus took the stripes on his back. I received that healing now, and I know that it's mine, whether I see the results of it right now or sometime in the future. I'm not going to fear this sickness. I'm not going to fret. I'm not going to be worried. I'm not going to give any attention to this sickness because as far as I'm concerned, I'm healed. That's who I am. Just like it says in the book of Mark, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You must believe you receive before you have. Believe you receive and then you will have. And the best modern day example I can give you is an Amazon package. Y'all go into the digital world. You click that buy now button and you know that package is going to show up on your door one day later. It's going to be there. You don't doubt it. You have more faith in Amazon than you have in God. Good gracious. When you ask God for something in the spiritual realm, trust that it's done and expect it to show up in the physical realm. You don't know when, but it's coming. It's coming. So don't give up.